throughout the country, there is a seafarer center much like this. And much like this, it is run by volunteers, donors, we are a nonprofit, so our organization is dependent on the generosity of all of you, all of the community. So, for any of us who would love to be part of uh, the International Maritime Center in one way or another, volunteering one day out of the month, uh, volunteering as much as you can, uh, we definitely have opportunities to come and uh, visit ships, to be a ship visitor, to be a caring face, a caring voice to those who are on ship for nine months out of a year. Maybe they never even get to leave the ship. Uh, so, uh, and also running the building, maintaining the building, maybe just coming here, hanging out, doing your homework, uh, doing your studies, doing other things and just keeping the center open so a seafarer can hang out here, use the internet, communicate with their family, call their parents. We just had a, one seafarer here who uh, was calling his family for the first time in about a month or so. So that's the kind of opportunities that the International Maritime Center offers. So those of us who are inclined for the maritime community, this is a wonderful opportunity to give back to the community that we're all Part of. So, if you're interested and you want to be a part of this community, uh, please, everybody, I really encourage you to fill out our sign-in list, take our brochures, take our cards at the front. Uh, with that, I would like to introduce our speaker for the evening, and he can introduce himself properly, uh, Pierce McDonald. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much, Jameson, and thank you all so much for coming out to my talk this evening. It's been a pleasure to visit this spot for the first time today and start to get a window into what it's like in the modern seafaring industry. My name is Pierce McDonald, and I'm a college student from San Francisco with an interest in maritime history. What I'm most passionate about are stories, the stories we tell about the past and about where we're headed. I'm looking forward to relating to you some of my favorite stories this evening of brave crew members who, we who weathered terrible storms and of captains dedicated to their vessels. I first became interested in the maritime world when I heard an old family story about how my great-grandfather owned a ship that wrecked. What was the ship? Where was it going? What was it carrying? I wanted to know more. What began as a desire to figure out the mystery of one story expanded when I found that every story is interconnected with so many more. In researching this project, I met many people, a shipwreck diver, a college professor, and I even met a man who's always been fascinated with Stetson himself ever since he heard the story of how his father immigrated to the United States from Mexico aboard the ship in 1920. Now our audience members tonight come from many professions, but what ties us all together across our various trades is the sea. These blue waters have always been humanity's key source of food, of transportation, and of wonder. Can everyone hear me by the way? Just make sure. If my friends and family who don't work in the maritime industry think I'm leaving them out in that description, I'm really not. The clothes we wear, the cars we drive, the food we eat, in fact, 90% of everything you use was carried on a container ship before it arrived at your doorstep. Without this churning hub of oceanic industry, we would all be stopped in our tracks. When people who don't work in the seafaring industry think of maritime history, they can sometimes see that the sea is an industry of the past, confined to the romance of the novels of Patrick O'Brien and Herman Melville. In fact, while our society's focus may have turned away from the sea, it continues to play a fundamental role in our world, and the story of the sea is an essentially human one. But today, 
I want to bring you back a few years to California's early 20th century steamship era. It's from this fairly recent time period that I bring you these stories of the exciting life of the steam schooner, J.B. Stetson. For San Franciscans today, the city's time as a port city may seem like a distant memory. Here you can see the cranes outside and the boxes of containers that dot, that dot the color in bright, that dot the shore with bright colors. But in San Francisco, <coughs> you'd be hard pressed to think of it as a modern port city. It's very hard to imagine how, these, how those docks must have looked in the early 20th century. But in fact, the city of San Francisco was once the hub of West Coast uh, lumber trade, situated on the route along which was carried lumber uh, from Washington, Oregon, and Northern California, down to San Francisco and beyond. On this route were also transported tools, fish, farm produce, and other products. In the early days, the lumber was carried by inefficient square riggers, then by large sail schooners, and finally by steam schooners, wooden but powered. The production of steam schooners began in the late 19th century, continuing into the early 20th. The steam schooner of this book being built uh, in 1906, that's this ship here called the J.B. Stetson, um, and the last one being constructed in 1923. Today, unfortunately, there are no surviving examples of this magnificent vessel. The Stetson served the five major seaports between Canada and Mexico, uh, any guesses on what, what, what the five major seaports may have been at that time? Seattle. Seattle. Yeah. Portland. San Francisco, Seattle. LA, San Diego. Wow, that's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> this, in addition to these five major ports, the Stetson also served the numerous tiny ports which dotted the shoreline all up and down the coast. These little ports were so hard to navigate that they were nicknamed dog hole ports because the vessels that squeezed their way in and out had to be able to turn around in a harbor barely large enough for a dog. Dog hole schooners like the J.B. Stetson were crucial for transporting lumber out of these hard to reach lumber towns and bringing it to booming cities like San Francisco and Los Angeles. They were also important in picking up minerals from faraway northern mines and fresh fruit, meat, vegetables, and fish from southern ports in Mexico as well as Central and South America. Now the era that we delve into as we begin our story was one of great uncertainty for seafarers. Ships could spring a leak very suddenly without warning, collide with other vessels with hardly a moment to react, become lost in a moment of fog, crash into jagged rocks, and were constantly at the mercy of the sea's temper. Maritime history was oftentimes a story of peril. Time and time again, the story of the J.B. Stetson was that of mishaps, misfortune, and disaster. But despite all these risks, the sea provided great rewards for those brave crews who hazarded its dangers and for the enterprising merchants who managed the vessels. Now to show what these perils were like for the crew of the J.B. Stetson, having first given that general introduction, I'd like to read you an account of one terrible storm written by the last captain of the J.B. Stetson. This captain's name is Carl Hubner. He had been in command of the J.B. Stetson for less than a year at this point, but he had decades of experience at sea ever since his early childhood in Germany. He said, it was a mighty hard fight. Saturday night, we ran into the worst snorter I have known on this coast. It must have been blowing a hundred knots. I never felt anything like it. I could not get over the bar as it was breaking, and all I could do was lay down and trust that the weather would lighten. First, we listed to starboard so heavily that the chains lashing the deck load lumber on that side snapped and dumped 150,000 feet of lumber into the sea. Then we rolled over to port and lost as much timber on that side. The rigging of the mainmast was torn away by falling timber, and shortly, the mast snapped and went down starboard. How the crew escaped, I do not know, except that there is a special provision to protect sailors. Some of the deck load lumber got washed up on the bridge, and first thing I knew, the bridge and main house were groaning and we had to get off. Then a mighty sea came along, 
caught us clean amidship, and the house crumbled and went over, just like you would crush a paper bag. Even then, everybody seemed able to get out of the way. The afterdeck over the boilers and engines came in for its share of damage. But the chief and below deck's crew stood by as though nothing had happened, in spite of the wash of, wealth, a wash of water which made an awful steam cloud. We've had to keep the pumps going day and night ever since. There is a slow leak someplace. At daylight this morning, I decided to try to get into port. Nothing could get out to help us, and we had to take our chance on the bar. So, with the our auxiliary gear, with the auxiliary gear rigged, I headed her in. As we approached the bar, the waves curled up behind us, mountains high, and threatened to break over the poop deck. Finally, one did, and at the same time, we struck bottom. I thought it was all off. There wasn't a chance for anybody on board if we broke up, but the old ship held together, and bumping twice more, but still afloat, we managed to tool our way in. And here we are, safe. In this next photo, you can see, uh, this is Captain Hubner with the ship's mascot, Flossie, standing next to him. Captain Hubner made it through this uh, tumultuous storm, and the ship was well repaired. He, in fact, managed to get six more productive years out of the J.B. Stetson before it finally met its end in 1934. On the fateful evening of September 1st, the Stetson set out from Long Beach for her final journey, while Captain Carl Hubner kept stern watch from the bridge of the sea ahead. While he bore the ship's course from Monterey in San Francisco, a formidable bank of fog in the heavens watched the wooden vessel bobbing below and prepared its final attack. The first two days, fortunately, proceeded without incident. In the smooth, dark water, Hubner navigated the Stetson's way forward with care. On the second evening, he weaved northeast, figuring that he would be well clear of Point Cyprus and get into soundings in order to pick up the Point Pinos fog whistle. This was a fatal miscalculation. As night wore on, the ship's clock struck midnight, and so began the third and final day of the Stetson's voyage. After three and a half miles on this northeast, coast, uh, northeast course, Hubner stopped for a sounding and found the water to be still very deep. Shortly afterwards, he stopped for another sounding, and a few minutes later, another. Rocks! Right ahead! shouted the men on the lookout. Captain Hubner jumped into action, ringing for full speed astern, yanking the telegraph several short jerks to tell the crew to back the ship with her full power. But it was too late. With the ship being loaded light and that freight being loaded in the alleyways, the Stetson did not respond, but slid right ahead and onto the rocks. Captain Hubner tried to back her off the rocks, but the jagged, the jagged rocks held the ship firm and fast. At one o'clock in the morning, on the night of September 3rd, 1934, the Stetson was made a prisoner, captured by the jagged rocks of Cypress Point. Thanks to the miraculous rescue by a Coast Guard vessel, which only happened to be in the area because of, it was looking for a, a missing fishing boat, uh, all the lives of the crew were saved. You can see in those photos over there, uh, people, some spectators standing around looking at the wreck of the vessel, which happened just off of the uh, Cypress Point Golf Course near Monterey. And in another shot, you can see the uh, see another angle from the wreck at a different time than you think. Unfortunately, the Stetson itself could not be saved. In two short days, the vessel the vessel was smashed to splinters by the Monterey waters. Not a single part of the ship or its cargo could be salvaged. Now this is how the J.B. Stetson finally met its end. But I'd like to take us back further to an event that occurred at the beginning of the vessel's life. Oh, here, here you can also see the crew taking its last look at the sinking J.B. Stetson as they're carried off by the Coast Guard cutter Daphne. And this is second mate William Henson uh, holding the leash, the leash uh, for Flossie, and this is a member of the Coast Guard who's 
help helping the crew members get off the vessel. So this was how the J.B. Setson finally met her end, but I'd like to take us back further to the very beginning of the Setson's life. And this, you can see, is Captain Bonifield. Uh, Samuel Bonifield was the first captain of the Stetson, and a very interesting character. So in the vessel's early years, the J.B. Stetson was co-owned by Ira J. Harmon, who was an important player in the uh, coal mining industry in Oregon and Washington, and Samuel Bonifield, who was uh, an old captain who had spent half a century at sea. Bonifield's lifetime of work at sea had given him a luxurious life. His two sons both held lucrative careers, but despite his financial success, the old captain, for some reason, was unwilling to settle down uh, into a, life, a calm life on land and wanted to go out to sea even into his old age. So Captain Bonifield, after a lifetime of commanding ships at sea, became directly involved with the construction of the steam schooner J.B. Stetson. Bonifield visited the site in person where the vessel was being built to instruct the ship's builders on how to tailor it exactly to his wishes. He combined the favorite elements of all of his previous vessels to make the, for, the, for his ideal ship. And it was this man, Captain Samuel Bonifield, who uh, saw the Stetson through her early years and who chose to sail the ship out to sea into dangerous waters rather than to enjoy the hard-earned fruits of his retirement. Captain Bonifield uh, commanded the Stetson for six years, the same amount of time as the last captain of the, of the Stetson. But unfortunately, these were not easy times for the vessel. They included San Francisco's devastating 1906 earthquake and fire, as well as a few rough voyages. In one, Captain Bonifield accidentally crashed into and destroyed the barkentine Jane L. Stanford without realizing its mistake and continued ahead. Uh, this, this vessel was uh, named for the co-founder of the famous university, and the destruction of this important vessel caused Bonifield and his chief officer to be suspended from their work uh, by the U.S. local inspectors of steam vessels for a year. However, Bonifield successfully appealed this decision and was able to regain his mariner's license after he argued that he was not on the bridge at the time of the accident, and therefore could not be blamed for the, for the collision. Nonetheless, this embarrassment of, the mis of this mishap uh, undoubtedly convinced, as we'll later see, undoubtedly convinced Bonifield to never again commit the same mistake. And in the future, he did not easily leave his position on the bridge to retreat to his cabin. I'll move ahead a little bit, but I, I can only say that the other voyages under Bonifield's watch um, unfortunately included a whole variety of further accidents and uh, frights, but too many to get into tonight, but you can read about it in the Stetson book. But on Bonifield's very last voyage, he commanded the J.B. Stetson out of San Francisco for San Pedro on March 17, 1911. Although Bonifield was recovering from an attack of pneumonia, the hardy man said when he left the port, that he considered himself fit to, take the, fit to take the boat out as usual. His condition, but not his outlook on life, worsened on the voyage, and he began, <clears throat> as he began the trip back to San Francisco from San Pedro. The officers could see the gravity of his illness and prevailed upon him to leave his position on the bridge and take to his cabin. But late in the night, as he lay dying in his bunk, the ravages of sickness having worn him weak. His mind was suddenly taken by a powerful delirium. He pulled his way out of his sheets, climbed his way out of his bunk, and although his officers and crew told him to go back to rest, he refused to listen. With a firm and steady step, he trod the deck, and then with his face to the open sea and in silence, he stood and waited. The minutes dragged along. Before sheer dominance of will, the others in his crew gave way. Then suddenly, his crew and all of the ship's worried passengers saw Captain Bonifield stagger, slip, and then fall down to the deck. 
His unconscious body was lifted by the crew, but as they carried him down, he thrust them aside once again, ordering them out of his, his way and demanding that he be allowed to keep his post. But the fantasies of his sickness passed, and he sleepily went down to his cabin after all. Amazingly, just hours before his death, he rose again from his cabin, straining with every step. His magnificent will overmastered the weakness of his body once again, and he went out to the poop deck to gaze once more on the sea that had rocked him for half a century. Then climbing back to his bunk slowly, he died. The next story I'd like to relate comes from the next uh, owner, the second owner of the J.B. Stetson, a man by the name of Earl Stafford Hicks. Hicks was in the lumber business, and although these were for the Stetson a few stable and relatively profitable years, the adventures of the J.B. Stetson were far from over. The first thrill under Hicks's watch was the instant with the C.A. Thayer, a ship with which you may be familiar. Has anybody seen been on the Thayer before? So it's, uh, it's this historic vessel that's preserved at the San Francisco Maritime Museum, and you can go and walk, walk around on the ship today, and still preserved in the same, same condition as it, as it was at this time. And this, this lumber schooner was launched in 1895, um, and so it was fairly old at this time, but it's still held up well to the present day. At the time of her encounter with the Stetson, though, the Stetson was owned, uh, that's rather, the Thayer was owned by the E.K. Lumber Company. And in January 1912, on one of her regular lumber voyages, she sank almost to the deck line. The crew, weak and famished, could only be kept going on coffee and bread. They, although the crew struggled through a 10-day fight, they were able to make it through due to the captain's 21-year-old wife, Carol Scott, who kept the crew motivated throughout the storm. If it were not for her, the Thayer might very well have gone to the bottom of the sea. Two days south of Grace Harbor, Washington, the Thayer had sprung a leak, and the crew was put to work on hand pumps, trying to keep the water out. The captain's wife went down to investigate the trouble herself, and found how serious the condition was. The water was rising faster than it could be pumped out, and there was no locating the leak, now deep underwater. <coughs> Steam pumps were engaged, but they made little difference. And the crew made their best efforts, but after 48 hours of exhausting work, they were, they were suddenly hit with a terrible storm. The sailors later recalled, it was this moment that brought out the pluck in the captain's wife. When the storm went down for a bit, she came around with coffee and bread. She told us we ought to strike for extra pay being worked overtime. That's the way she joked and laughed while we worked at the pumps or just rode, the way, rode through the storm without being able to do anything. The seas crashed over with this, the fair with every wave, and the water filling the vessel was robbing the ship of all its buoyancy, making all the crew easy prey for the storm. But the sailors remarked, one night she sang to us, and she used to stand next to the captain while he was at the wheel and sing to him all the time. She carried us through and kept up heart, and she saved the schooner for the owners, too. Almost a week after the vessel first sprang the leak, a, a ship owned by the Pacific Coast Steamship Company, named the President, uh, first sighted the smoke of, this, of the steamer. The Thayer hoisted its ensign upside down to signal its distress. While the passengers aboard the President looked down at the battered schooner, and Captain F. D., uh, while Captain F.D. Scott asked uh, the captain of the other vessel to send for a tug. Then, Captain Scott of the Thayer insisted that his wife be transferred to the president, but she refused, saying, if you go down, I go down. I'm going to stay with you. If it's dangerous for me, then it's dangerous for you. And if it's dangerous for you, then it's the place I belong, and I'm going to stay here. Young Mrs. Scott remained resolute in her refusal, while the uh, captain of the president fumed about the delays to his schedule. The disagreement ended with the president steaming away and young Mrs. Scott staying on. After the ship passed us, the captain said, a thick fog settled down and the wind died down to nothing. We were becalmed, 
but it was dangerous, for we were drifting into shore. Prospects were bleak as they passed the night in this condition, wet and hungry and tired on a waterlogged ship drifting into shore. The gray night passed, and the dim morning light came, but when the fog failed to lift, the captain got out the red fire flares, red fire flares as a final resort <coughs> and burned them on the deck. In the middle of the day, they were suddenly surprised to hear a whistle up the coast, a whistle that belonged to the J.B. Stetson. The tune of that whistle, the captain later said, took a load off our hearts. The Stetson passed us a line and sent over a relief crew, while my men got the first rest they'd had in a week. If the Stetson had not arrived, there's no telling what would have happened to us. With four men of the Stetson at the pumps, the vessel was kept afloat. The Stetson then towed the fair to shore, saving the crew of eight men, the 390-ton vessel, 540,000 feet of lumber, the two-year master of the ship, and his fearless wife. When asked if he intended to put his wife aboard the Stetson for the return, Captain Scott did not have time to answer before Mrs. Carroll Scott spoke up, saying, Do you think I would leave that husband of mine all alone to, dip, to take all that strain? Captain Scott said, No, I did not send her to the other vessel for the simple reason that she would not have gone. She was right at the job every minute, helping me keep the men cheerfully working. So if you ever go to see the Thayer later, make sure you remember this story about how the J.P. Stetson rescued the Thayer. My other class is going on. Oh, cool. The next story comes about a decade later. After the Stetson had changed ownership several times and had many other different adventures. The ship's route now ran to Mexico and South America. It was on one of these voyages in 1920 that the Conrick family immigrated to Los Angeles. I heard the story from Ephraim Conrick, who had written about his family's immigration story online, and whom I met at the San Diego Maritime Museum, where he is a longtime volunteer. And maybe I'll toggle between these two. The next one is at the San Diego Maritime Museum, which is also a really great maritime museum to visit, by the way. They have, uh, Really large collection of historic vessels, um, and the previous so the previous photo is um, of Mr. Conrique's family um, that was taken for their passport, and so these are his grandparents in front, and then all of their uh, children in that photo. So in, in 1920, uh, Mr. Conrique's paternal grandparents arrived at the port of Los Angeles, disembarking the. San Francisco home ported ship, the J.B. Stetson, uh, for after one of her voyages to Mexico. They stepped off the Stetson with eight children, including his father, three nannies, and voluminous luggage. In response to many in his family's requests for information on its own ancestry and culture, Mr. Conrique has done extensive research into his family's genealogy and history. and has now documented more than 600 relatives over 11 Kanrik generations, including those of more than 250 descendants of family members of his grandfather. And because of his grandparents disembarking into the United States uh, from the J.D. Stetson, he's also developed a keen interest in the story of the ship, and has, has obtained over the years a number of photos of the vessel, including pictures of the ship in the 1920s as it was cradled and broken by the treacherous rocks off Monterey's Cypress Point uh, in 1934. So although the Stetson was a commercial cargo freighter that often carried lumber as its primary load, in the aftermath of World War I and during the Mexican Revolution, it would also carry passengers during some of those trips. Conrique says that on his grandparents' voyage, the ship's manifest reflected carrying 10 passengers from Balboa Canal Zone and including the 11 from his grandparents' group, 17 additional passengers boarding in Manzanillo, Mexico. Conri considers a photo of the lumber-laden Stetson one of his favorites, because with its lumber load, it's configured the same way as described by his grandmother on their trip, as she would relate to me 
where her perpetually exploring teenage grandsons would scramble throughout the ship and climb all over the lumber with their father. Mr. Conrique went on to serve in the U.S. Navy during the Korean War, with his specialty having been in the then early field of military electronics. It was during this time of service that he had a very interesting connection with the story of the J.B. Stetson. In 1953 and 1954, Conrique was the uh, Electronics and Instrumentation Commissioning Officer for the new Naval Air Intercept Training Facility that was being established in Monterey's Point Pinos, which is right where the ship of the J.B. Stetson wrecked. And he says that during that time of naval service, as I did everywhere I, sent, I was sent, I would take the opportunity to visit as many points of interest as I could find in that area. He says that Monterey's 17-mile drive and Cypress Point Golf Course shoreline were some of my favorite driving and walking areas, and that coincidentally, and of course, unbeknownst to me at the time, but I am now quite certain, I stood on the same rocks as shown in the photos of the J.D. Stetson breaking offshore, as you can see right over there, while remnants of the ship still lay in the sands some 20 to 50 feet underwater, 100 short yards away. And there you can see those same remnants of the ship, a little uh, miscellaneous pieces left over from the, from the steam scooter um, out of all the plaques, plaques there. But I thought it was fascinating to learn how so many people that I met in my research had their own connections to this miscellaneous random ship um, that had meant so much to my family because of my uh, great-grandfather's story. <coughs> now, I believe that brings us to the end of our time this evening, but I have more stories to relate, uh, and I would be happy, happy to talk with you more um, individually about particular, particular elements of the J.B. Stetson's adventures. But I hope you enjoyed this small sampling of stories from the exciting life of the steam schooner J.B. Stetson. I'd like to thank my parents, my great aunt Caroline, who is the daughter of the man who owned the J.B. Stetson, and uh, everyone else who's helped me with this project, and to everyone who's helped me learn more about the maritime world. Thank you all for coming out tonight and listening to my presentation. listening to an audible version of the Sea Wolf. <laughs> um, I think if there's one point we can take from his presentation is that even one merchant ship, a casual merchant ship just doing its thing up and down the ship, can affect so many people's lives. So all of us here in the maritime community connected to a ship, we all affect so many different people's lives just in what we do. So maybe we can uh, take uh, three, four, maybe five questions, if they're good questions. Uh, <laughs> if anybody has any questions for Pierce. Just have a quick technical question. Is that China Basin? Yeah, that is actually. And I wish I could show you more detail in this photo, but it actually has an enormous amount of, of detail because this was taken on a, on a glass plate negative. So you can see like all the little things that are like happening as people are unloading lumber from the sets. <coughs> that right there is the name flag that you can read says JP sets. Yeah, so it's, it's all right there, right there in China basically. Is that the slide that has your uh, great grandfather? Uh, not this one, but the, the first first slide at the beginning you can oh, see okay. it. Yeah, I remember, remember you showed one at the Maritime mm -hmm. Museum where you could where you zoomed in on it. Any other questions? Sorry, that was a very good question. Pearson, <laughs> can you talk about the process you went through mm -hmm. in researching this? How did you, where were you finding documents? Sure. Um, how did you connect with people who may have known about it? I think yeah, that, that's a big question. Okay. I think that during the process of um, all, all this research, um, I got two main takeaways. And the first one is, um, which came naturally as a kid of the 21st century that you can find a ton online from like newspaper sources and uh, books and all, all kinds of resources that help with the research. Um, that, that was an important source. 
And the other thing that I learned was that not everything is online, and that there's so much out there in the, the San Francisco Maritime Museum Research Center, and um, these other uh, really great maritime museums in uh, California, up and down the West Coast, um, which have uh, preserved uh, many really great um, resources for, for researchers in maritime history. Thank you.